good evening to everyone and welcome to today's session <clears throat> today we are going to have uh, four main topics in uh, anatomy so this is our day 2 day 2 or day 3 day 2 of anatomy so in the day 1 we have reviewed median nerve all the muscles and the nerve supply in the upper limb is a another interesting topic then circle of willis cerebral circulation and the vessels of the head and neck is what we have reviewed yesterday so today we shall review cranial nerves one of the most favorite question of the examiner then brachial plexus in the upper limb is uh, a very very important topic all the other nerves other than the median nerve then uh, <coughs> coronary circulation on which a lot of questions come and uh, if we still have time energy patience couple of more topics so let's make the great beginning we invite dr kirti shahila madhavi akshara deepika kavi neena our students in tirupati karnool vaizag etc so olfactory nerve any cranial nerve is basically divided based upon what it is serving is it carrying afferents to the brain or efferents to the periphery and uh, is it from the general viscera or from the somites or from the special viscera from there it is carrying afferents and efferents accordingly we have a special visceral afferent olfactory nerve because olfaction is fundamentally a special sensation is what need to be remembered so what is the speciality of this olfactory nerve they are all unmyelinated axons of the bipolar neurons which are located in the nasal mucosa and the olfactory epithelium is what you have to basically remember <clears throat> hope the voice is clear is the voice okay yeah right so how does it enter into the skull it is to the cribriform fossa so from the olfactory mucosa through the cribriform fossa it makes an entry into the calvarium now normally any sensory afferent first has to reach thalamus because thalamus is the locus from which is a relay station for the all the sensory input but the exception is the olfactory nerve which directly projects to the telencephalon and uh, in the telencephalon it will be synapsing with mitral and tufted cells which are found in the olfactory bulb um is what i want to underscore so this is another common question in the exam mitral and tufted cells are associated with which cranial nerve so it is with the olfactory nerve so olfactory is the only cranial nerve which directly projects to the forebrain and uh, what is a possible cause olfactory can get affected and anosmia can develop doctor any fracture to the ethmoid bone classically can lead to the development of the injury while it is ascending up olfactory nerve optic nerve i don't want to teach why because in ophthalmology half our life was wasted in reviewing where was optic chasma what is optic tract where do you get superior quadrant anopia inferior quadrant anopia mayer slough geniculate bodies colliculi so all those things we have extensively reviewed in ophthalmology right doctor of course in medical college we used to have some wonderful teachers who used to say there's no use of reading olfactory now i mean optic now you can read when you go for ophthalm posting and ophthalm professor says since you have already read optic now let me start ophthalmology he will say so it is like algebra now oculometer yes so we have discussed this in uh, ophthalmology still it deserves 
a re-mentioning. It has got general somatic efferent and it also has general viscerant efferent fibers and it is a pure motor nerve, nothing to do with sensory system. Why it is called general visceral efferent fibers? Because ultimately those fibers will go and supply the sphincter pupillae, dilator pupillae are there, no? So that is the reason there uh, the uh, pupilloconstrictor fibers, parasympathetic uh, efferents are passing. So that is the reason it is called general visceral efferents are there in it. Since it is supplying extraocular muscles, it is called as general somatic efferent is also there in it is what you have to appreciate. So it moves the eyes, constricts the pupil, accommodates. How does it lead to accommodation? It leads to contraction of ciliary muscle. If the ciliary muscle is contracted, the ligament of zonules are there now which are holding the lens. They either become taut or slackened. Accordingly, curvature of the lens will change. Accordingly, refractory power will change. It also lead to convergence of both the eyes while we are reading any near object. So from there, if this oculobot are leaving, you all know there is a brain stem. Midbrain, palms and medulla. Typically in the midbrain it will be leaving, third, fourth cranial nuclei are there in the midbrain. Five, six, seven are in palms, eight, nine, everything in medulla. So, it typically leaves the midbrain at the interpeduncular fossa, it is called as in its journey towards the eye. Now, while it is traveling, it typically passes through the lateral wall of this uh, cavernous sinus. Now, what are all the constituents of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, doctor? You have an oculomotor, trochlear, abducens, ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve and the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. So, these are all the part of the cranial nerve. And what is bathing inside the venous blood of the cavernous sinus? Carotid artery. The other day we have studied. Carotid artery and branches. Then how does oculomotor enter the eye? One of the favorite MCQs in the exam is what are the constituents of superior, inferior orbital fissure? Like a parrot you must rattle out in the tomorrow's exam. So, typically it passes to the superior orbital fissure, the oculomotor nerve. So, now let us first see what is the general somatic efferent component of it. So, from the oculomotor nucleus in the midbrain, it will be starting. And it will ultimately innervate all the extraocular muscles. Except the, what are the two muscles? Abducens supplies lateral rectus and superior oblique is by the trochlea, right? Except the two. And uh, you remember that uh, sin, what is sin? Superior muscles are intortors, whether it is superior rectus or superior oblique, they both are intortors of the globe. So, it typically goes and uh, innervates the superior rectus, inferior rectus and inferior oblique and uh, medial rectus. So, what does medial rectus does? It basically edit the eye and uh, when both the eyes medial recti are working, then there is a convergence while we are reading the books. Then superior rectus elevates. And all superiors are fundamentally intortors, right? So it will be intorting and adducting the eye. They are the three functions of superior rectus. Inferior rectus basically will cause uh, depression, extortion. All inferiors are extortors, superiors are intortors. And uh, that means all superiors means who are the two superiors? One superior rectus, one superior oblique. One inferior rectus, one inferior oblique. But luckily, both the inferior rectus, inferior oblique, both of them are oculomotor only. Whereas superiors may, what are the two things? You have superior rectus, superior oblique. 
both of them are fundamentally superior to all in intortors one intortor is by oculomotor other intortor is by trochlear and uh, so if at all there is any paralysis of oculomotor then what will happen the one intortor is paralyzed who is that intortor superior uh, rectus but the other intortor superior oblique is still intact who should antagonize a intortor some extractor should do that who are the extractors then inferior rectus inferior oblique but both the extractors are paralyzed if the oculomotor is paralyzed so who is unopposed then the only intortor superior oblique supplied by trochlear is unopposed because complete uh, all extractors that is both uh, inferior rectus inferior oblique both of them supplied by oculomotor nerve got paralyzed hence i will go into intortion right so that's a deal then inferior oblique it will be elevating generally inferior rectus will depress but oblique will elevate and all inferiors are extractors and also it will abduct the eye then what is the very important function of uh, the only muscle in the face all facial muscles are by facial nerve motor supply the only muscle is levator palpebris superioris is the one which is innervated by the oculomotor it is the one which elevates the upper lip hence in oculomotor palsy we have got the tosis then what is the visceral efferent component general visceral efferent it is that parasympathetic innervation that the oculomotor nerve will be carrying is basically called general visceral efferent so how does it basically travel you all remember when the light falls on the retina it travels to the optic nerve and it will be reaching the pretectal nucleus in the midbrain from pretectal nucleus both the edinger west walls have been informed and uh, because both of them are informed this pupil that pupil both of them will constrict direct light reflex consensual light reflex also so from the edinger west wall it will go to the ciliary ganglion through ciliary ganglion it will be going ultimately to the sphincter pupillae and lead to the development of the pupillary constriction and since the other edinger west wall also doing the same when you throw the light in one eye it is also leading to constriction of the same eye and also the other eye also consensual reflex now doctor this edinger west wall nucleus typically projects ultimately to the ciliary ganglion is what we need to basically remember and the ciliary ganglion projects the from the ciliary ganglion post ganglionic parasympathetic fibers will go and ultimately innervate the sphincter pupillae muscles and the ciliary muscle which is important for the accommodation now where do you find oculomotor paralysis is an important question if there is any subdural or epidural hematoma that increased pressure will lead to a transtentorial herniation of the medial part of the temporal lobe when the temporal lobe is herniating you have the brain stem here no so mid brain is over here so the oculomotor which is coming out of that mid brain become incarcerated between that herniated medial part of the temporal lobe and the mid brain and that typically get compressed so that is one of the important causes so whenever there is an oculomotor palsy we have studied in uh, ophthalmology paralytic strabismus what is one of the very characteristic feature of it presence of diplopia when will the diplopia will be more whenever the person looks in the direction of the paralytic action if my abducens is paralyzed it is expected to turn my right eye towards the right side so if i am looking towards my left side i don't have diplopia 
but when i look towards my right side then diplopia will be more so diplopia more when the person looks towards the action towards the side of the action of the paradic muscle is another important feature there will be presence of ptosis and how will be the eye doctor eye will be typically out because of the unopposed action of the lateral rectus supplied by abdescence and it will be looking down because of the unopposed action of the superior oblique which is a important intorter is what need to be remembered so it is the unopposed action how is this eye doctor paralyzed eye it is out and looking down looking down in slop up because of the intorsion so it's a very very uh, important feature then um, superior oblique and lateral rectus they are the ones which are not affected in oculomotor palsy and they are supplied by superior oblique by trochlear and lateral rectus by abdescence as all of you know very well then what are the other important feature once more you see this is the normal eye and this is the eye which is suffering oculomotor palsy it is typically out looking down and uh, pupil is typically dilated and it is fixed so this is a very typical feature but uh, will will you be able to appreciate that what is preventing you to appreciate that pupil dilatation ptosis is the one so lift the eyelid then you can appreciate the presence of the pupillary dilatation now uncle herniation as we said transtentorial herniation otherwise which will make the uncle part of the medial temporal lobe to herniate it leads to the constriction of oculomotor nerve now what is oculomotor nerve carrying basically two types of fibers one are pupillo constrictor fibers other are somatic efferent fibers going to the extraocular muscles will both of them get affected or only one of them get affected or which one is early to get affected this is the favorite question of the examiner in case of a transtentorial uncle herniation leading to the oculomotor palsy it is a pupillo constrictor fibers which are affected first resulting in a dilated and fixed pupil so tomorrow when you are in casualty you have a head injury case extradural hematoma is there you have always Housemen ship means you need to carry the torch light minimum. Why? Because if all the power is gone, you are worried. So at least to save yourself, you need to carry. Don't think government hospital casualties forever will have power supply. Huh? So other than that, why torch is needed? Any road traffic accident or a comatose patient, if you miss it to check the pupil, no use of doing four and half years medical school. it's all utter waste but for bookish knowledge right doctor so that's very very important so when you throw the light your classmate will be arguing hey this is not uncle herniation because in uncle herniation there will be oculomotor palsy if oculomotor palsy is there the eyeball must go out and down looking no sir told it is not going no so based on that can you rule out uncle herniation no sir because if there is uncle herniation by the time extraocular features come it takes little longer time the first to get affected very sensitively in a very early stage is pupils so that is the reason remember pupillo constrictor fibers are affected first leading to dilated fixed pupil and uh, somatic efferent fibers leading to axial strabismus exotropia is what you see at a later point then another very common cause when you go to neurosurgery ward a patient will be sitting with ptosis you lift the eyelid you will find a dilated pupil you pick his mri what is the classical feature the other day we have studied the circle of willis no right so in the circle of willis what did we study the two vertebral combined to form basilla basilla divides into partial cerebral partial cerebral and the carotid are typically connected right and carotid in turn will giving rise to anterior and middle so who are participating in the circle of willis 
faster communicating artery, the two posterior cerebral arteries, the internal carotid and anterior cerebral and anterior communicating artery. So this is the entire bent circle. Eh? You must be very sure. Now, any aneurysm of this posterior communicating artery is in a very close relationship with the midbrain. How do you know, doctor, in MRI that this is midbrain? How do you know? Are you able to see one uh, animal? Famous cartoon. What is that cartoon? Mickey Mouse. Midbrain looks like a mouse. This is the mouse. They are the ears. Like Arundhati Nakshatra, doctor, at the time of marriage, you must imagine at least. Purohit will be saying there is uh, seven uh, stars and all that in sky. Right? So, uh, this is a mouse doctor. I am not able to see a mouse. That's how in MRI you will recognize a midbrain. Okay? So, tomorrow only, it's a fun to, uh, housemanship means you are certified to fully practice what all that you had been incubating all the four and a half years. So, all the way, you are now very conceptually strong students. So, there is no way. Just you need to convert that into practice. Every day is a case shopping, learning, some new findings. Eh? So, doctor, in the midbrain, when this oculometer is exiting, this posture communicating artery aneurysm is compressing on it is a very common cause, leading to the development of oculometer palsy. Just like in uncle herniation, tubular constrictor fibers are the ones which typically get affected first whenever there is any aneurysm. Then how about diabetes? Typically diabetes, hypertension, they lead to oculometer palsy. Why? Because diabetes, hypertension will lead to arthrosclerosis of the mass and nervosum. So they decrease the blood flow, lead to hypoxic injury to the oculometer nerve and lead to oculometer palsy. But they typically damage um, the central fibers because central fibers are more dependent on the blood supply coming from this vas and nervosa. Central fibers contain the contain the fibers that go to levator palpebrae brain and all the other things. Peripheral fibers go to pupillar constrictor muscles, sphincter pupillae. So they are spared. Only central fibers are involved. Hence pupil is not involved. So that is the reason whenever you have a patient with ptosis coming to you, lift his eyelid if pupil is normal. Nothing to worry. You check his sugar levels, BP levels. Control him, talk to him about Framingham's study results, everything you need to do with your patient. But if pupil is dilated with ptosis, give a ring to neurosurgeon. The resident will come, take him to the MRI, he will get a report. By the time your night duty in uh, casualty is over, next day morning before you are going for the breakfast, go and check how was the MRI film. He will show you classically a communicating artery aneurysm. Right, doc? So that should be the goal. <clears throat> so trochlear nerve. Trochlear, trochlear is a pure general somatic efferent. Only what it knows is go and supply the muscles and make them contract. What is the only muscle it will do? It will do the superior oblique. Superior oblique is a depressor, intorter and abductor of the eye. And uh, one very interesting fact about uh, trochlear. Trochlear nerve of my right side which is supplying my right uh, lateral rectus, oh, sorry, superior oblique, it arises from the contralateral trochlear nucleus in the midbrain. And after arising, it will decussate within the midbrain. And then it will come out. It is my right trochlear only, leading to going to my right uh, uh, superior oblique. But at the nuclear level may, it is the left trochlear nucleus in the midbrain which is sending the fibers to my right side and exiting out as my 
right trochlear that's the most important point then another interesting thing about trochlear when everything comes from the ventral aspect of the brain stem the only nerve which comes from the dorsal aspect will be the trochlear and you have this inferior colliculus no inferior colliculus is important for inferior colliculus into the superior colliculus sustadi so that's the reason uh, you are uh, on uh, hearing inferior colliculus it is in a close relationship this trochlear just an anatomical relationship now it passes to the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus just like oculomotor and it will be entering just like oculomotor through the superior orbital fissure copycat everything it will do like oculomotor but ultimately it will go and uh, innervate the superior oblique and uh, whenever the trochlear is paralyzed what will happen extortion of the eye is what you typically come across because if the trochlear is paralyzed who is the only extractor uh, who is the only intractor available superior rectus but there are two extractors available who are they inferior oblique and inferior rectus which are supplied by oculomotor nerve they will pull the eye into an extortion so there is a reason what will happen doctor there is an extortion of the eye weakness of the downward gaze vertical diplopia one boyfriend up one boyfriend down two boyfriends will be visible vertical diplopia and uh, patient will try to tilt the head to overcome this extortion fundamentally so whenever there is for example right superior oblique then the extortion of the right eye will lead to diplopia so that is the reason to overcome that the patient will be tilting the chin also towards the right side of course this is the which side uh, where is the chin tilt chin uh, chin is uh, tilted towards left side no that means which side uh, should be the superior oblique palsy left not right am i right extortion of the right eye causes diplopia so the tilting of the chin to the right side will result in a compensatory intortion of the left eye permitting a binocular alignment otherwise if left superior oblique is involved then the patient will be tilting the chin towards the left side so that he will overcome the so what is this we are describing here right but here the image is about the left superior oblique uh, palsy okay doc then trigeminal is our uh, uh, next important uh, topic it contains general somatic efferent why some muscles are innervated by motor supply it also has special visceral efferent fibers also special visceral efferent i'll come why it has become sva so what mainly trigeminal is important for mastication so muscles of mastication general cutaneous sensation on the face eye nasal oral cavities everywhere they are able to feel the touch means it is all because of the courtesy trigeminal nerve trigeminal nerve is called the nerve of the first mandibular arch i mean first pharyngeal arch second pharyngeal arch nerve is seventh nerve s per second s per seventh and it exits the brain stem from where third fourth is from mid brain 5 6 7 is from pons So fifth is from pons, and what does it basically contain? <clears throat> trigeminal's representation in the brain stem is very extensive, doctor. If trigeminal is not there, whether the wind touches, whether somebody slaps, whether we sleep on a pillow or on a floor on a railway platform, nothing will be felt by our uh, skin. 
if god would have created there is no difference between a rich man and a poor man you will get no nice uh, advertisements of a five star hotel soft pillows if you are not happy with the softness call us we will serve you another softer pillow because of hypersensitive trigeminal so the first order sensory neurons of the trigeminal uh ganglion typically and uh, there is a sensory ganglion for it and there is a mesencephalic nucleus in the midbrain and uh, the mesencephalic nucleus basically contains there is one sensory nucleus one motor nucleus the motor neurons in the motor trigeminal nucleus of the rostral pons so this is how the various uh, nuclei of the trigeminal are wide distributed so head area of the primary sensory cortex it receives the fibers which come from the uh, any sensory need to finally project to the thalamus so in the thalamus you have the ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus from where from there it goes to the sensory cortex how will it reach the thalamus typically you are having one motor trigeminal nucleus one pontine trigeminal nucleus one spinal trigeminal nucleus and uh, you have one mesencephalic trigeminal nucleus so you can see that uh, the uh, fibers which come from the face the sensory supply will reach first of all the sensory nucleus from there they will go to the vpm nucleus in the thalamus and from there they will be going to the sensory cortex is what i want to underscore to all of you now there are three divisions for the trigeminal ophthalmic maxillary mandibular one of the favorite mcqs in the exam is what are the branches of each of these divisions ophthalmic division frontal nerve supratrochlear supraorbital lacrimal and naso ciliary these are all the divisions of thalamic uh, nerve then you are having mandibular nerve mandibular is basically a mixed nerve it will be leaving the foramen ovale one of the favorite questions of the examiner mandibular division will be leaving through male ovale yam yam mandibular and uh, um ovale foramen ovale rotamax maxillary division will be leaving through we used to have rotamax pens no i don't know whether they are still there or not they used to pass through i mean maxillary now passes through foramen rotundum and mandibular now passes through mandibular division passes through foramen ovale is what you need to remember so what are the branches of it we have an auricular temporal buccal lingual inferior alveolar and all the nerves to the masticatory muscles they are all the ones which are the part of the mandibular division so if you look at the ophthalmic division of the mandibular nerve which uh, orifice it passes through the doctor superior orbital fissure along with whom along with the oculomotor and uh, trochlear then uh, maxillary will be passing through rotamax foramen rotundum mandibular will be passing through foramen ovale is what need to be remembered then if you look at uh, the trigeminal nucleus you have one motor nucleus the spinal mesencephalic principal nucleus it is called as then you are also having one trigeminal motor nucleus so if you look at the mandibular it is a mixed one so it carries uh, this is the sensory one spinal mesencephalic is spinal and mesencephalic and principal is uh, sensory so the sensory from prime primary i mean principal sense uh, spinal and mesencephalic and the motor from the trigeminal motor nucleus together will pass to the mandibular hence the mandibular division is fundamentally a mixed nerve is what need to be remembered now let us go through each of these components general somatic afferent afferent 
it's coming to the brain information is coming from the brain from there does the information come to the brain in gsa component of trigeminal from the face mucous membranes of the nasal and uh, oral cavities from the frontal sinus the teeth heart palate soft palate and deep structures of the head the proprioception from the muscles and the temporomandibular joint all will basically are carried by the gsa components then one more important thing is in the anterior and middle cranial fossa dura is also pain sensitive hence we get headache in uh, meningitis even that is also carried by the gsa component of the trigeminal is what you have to basically remember then along with the other friends who are the other friends of trigeminal tail nerve sir seven glossopharyngeal and vagus along with them it will also innervate the external ear in ent we studied no in anatomy of ent auricular temporal supplies what vagus supplies what what is nerve of jacob what is arnold's nerve all those things i too forgot you might might have also forgotten just go back to the notes and review the old video eh? because in exam these are all the bottlenecks which you have to be very clear then special visceral efferent so what are the important uh, uh, muscles it will innovate the muscles of the mastication temporalis masseter lateral and medial pterygoids then you have tensor tympani and valley palatini tensor valley palatini they are also supplied by the sve component what is the speciality of the tensor valley palatini generally palatine muscles means who is the nerve supply vagus glossopharyngeal these are the things that come to your mind but tensor valley palatini is the one which is supplied by the trigeminal trigeminal then the mylohyoid is also by this special visceral efferent uh, then uh, digastric you are having two bellies posterior anterior posterior is by the facial nerve but the anterior belly of the digastric is once more by the trigeminal nerve now doctor what are the important lesions of the fifth cranial nerve if there is any problem to trigeminal obviously there is a loss of the general sensation from the face and the mucous membranes of the oral and the nasal cavities since cornea whenever you touch the cornea with a wisp of cotton why will eyelid close because afferent is carried by fifth right and closure of the eyelid required seventh opening of the eyelid required third i is given so many options so it is the corneal reflexes afferent limb then the muscles of the mastication there will be a flaccid paralysis always whenever we talk flaccidity and spasticity what is flaccidity low and motor neuron type because directly if the trigeminal nerve itself is affected somewhere in its path then the paralysis of the tensor tympani in the middle ear so if the tensor tympani is affected what will happen normally tensor tympani is responsible for what is the main purpose it will tense the tympanic membrane as the name itself says by tensing the tympanic membrane what will it be able to do whatever the sound falls on the tympanic membrane gets magnified if it is a tense tympanic membrane for it to be conveyed through ossicles to reach the you have round window oval window no from there there are there are vibrations in the endolymph or perilymph whatever some fluid in the inner ear and that's how we are sensing the sound that's what we discussed no in anatomy of uh, ear in ent all right so if tensor tympani is affected tympanic membrane if it is not tense then if i happen to whisper in your ears you can't be able to perceive it right 
so the low pitched sounds low pitched sounds cannot be felt hence there will be hypacusis whereas with the stapedius if it is paralyzed what will happen if the stapedius is paralyzed nobody is there to stop uh, stapes hold the energy and enthusiasm of the ossicle stapes hence there is a banging into the ear inner ear even if i whisper you will listen it as why are you shouting like that so hyperacusis with stapedius paralysis hypacusis with tensor tympani paralysis which can occur in the patients who are having the trigeminal paralysis is what need to be remembered then the jaw become deviated this is an interesting question so the jaw movements are fundamentally by pterygoids so their weakness in trigeminal lesion will lead to weakness in the movement of the jaw the deviation of the jaw is towards the weak side because of the unopposed action of the opposite uh, lateral pterygoid and that lateral pterygoid has a habit of pushing that means my right lateral pterygoid will push my jaw towards my left side my left will push towards right side only if they push together equally then i can open the mouth without any deviation so common question asked is which direction will the jaw deviation will be it will be ipsilateral to the side of uh, uh, the lesion so the deviation jaw will be towards the weak side because other uh, normal one will push it is what need to be remembered now few comments on absent absent you all know very well only one muscle lateral rectus it is general somatic efferent which is lateral rectus which abducts the eye and it arises from the which nucleus absence nucleus absence nucleus has a very very important speciality why you will not forget absence nucleus because we said fifth sixth seventh are in pons once more pons has two parts caudal part and rostral part towards mid brain rostral part may you only have fifth nucleus but 6th and 7th both are towards the caudal part closer to the pontomedullary junction so if you look at the 7th cranial nerve it will be circumlocuting in its route around the absence right so it arises from the absent nucleus which is located in the lower pons caudal pons right now one more important thing that you need to know the other day we, dis we discussed internuclear ophthalmoplegia what is that if i am looking towards my right side my right absence is making my right eye move towards my right side same time my left oculomotor is expected to adduct my left eye right so who will tell the left oculomotor that your right absence is moving towards the right side there is a connecting tract called mlf medial longitudinal fasciculus which connects the oculomotor on one side with the absence on the other side suppose if that mlf suffers any demyelination what will happen when my let us say my left mlf is demyelinated then when my right eye is looking towards the right side my left eye doesn't cooperate and it remains without adduction in the primary position only that's called adductor lag so when that happens there is a diplopia immediately what will my abducting eye will do to overcome the diplopia it will quickly go into nystagmus with the fast component fast component bringing the eye back into the primary position got it summarize doctor if my left mlf is having a demyelination 
my left oculomotor nucleus does not lead to my eyeball to adduct when my right eye is abducting. Hence, that leads to a adductor lag when I am having a right conjugate gauge. And because of that, there is a diplopia. To overcome that, once more my contralateral, that is the left eye, will once more come to the primary position with the past component of the nystagmus. Right? So, that is all the story of MLF. Anyway, yesterday, today is just a small primer. From Monday onwards, we will have proper four days dedicated for neuroanatomy. Then, uh, I got a feedback then, instead of going in a high yield topic way, let us take up upper limb, lower limb, abdomen, conventional way, what is commonly asked in entrance, let us group those high yield topics into that particular part and then uh, we will go, because uh, we are mentally prepared to only listen, adlar ke baad, radial, radial ke baad, median, median ke baad, phalanges, Suddenly, if uh, a neuroanatomy topic like cranial nerve comes, our mind uh, does not settle well. At least we do not get that satiety of completion. So, from Monday we will have a proper uh, neuroanatomy, Monday to Thursday. Four days we will in a stretch finish in about uh, a 10 hour session. Huh? So, that is a plan, but anyway, let us finish the cranial nerves. So, doctor. The abducens will be leaving the brainstem from the inferior pontine sulcus and uh, it is one of the nerves which is passing through cavernous sinus. Is it passing through the cavernous sinus? Uh, yes, it passes through the Dorello canal and the cavernous sinus and it will be entering through the superior orbital fissure. So, this is how doctor, our earlier discussion, trochlear, trochlear typically will be arising from the midbrain and uh, it will decussate immediately and to the superior orbital fissure it enters and innervates the superior oblique. Then we are having from the lower part of the pons, the abducens arising, passing to the superior orbital fissure and supplying the lateral rectus muscle. Now, what happens with the Abducens paralysis, the most common isolated muscle paralysis of the extraocular muscle means abducens, because abducens is single action it has got. And because of that, what will, whenever it gets paralyzed, what will happen? Unopposed action of the all medially deviating muscles. Hence, there is a isotropia, convergent strabismus is what need to be remembered. Then, there is a horizontal diplopia. So, this is the favorite MCQ of the examiner. Which muscle paralysis lead to vertical diplopia? Superior oblique paralysis in case of the trochlear nerve injury. Abducens paralysis lead to horizontal diplopia. So, these are the two MCQs you must be quite sure. Where the maximum separation between the images will occur when the person looks towards the direction of the paralyzed uh, muscles action. Now, the next nerve is the facial nerve. Once more, facial nerve we had a marathon race in uh, anatomy in ENT. Right? But still for brevity we will quickly summarize what we have forgotten about it. Right? So, what does it contain? General somatic afferents, special visceral afferents, taste and other things are involved now. Special visceral efferents and general visceral efferents. Let us look into, uh, because it supplies some muscles, general visceral efferents. It, it, it supplies some of the special visceral muscles, secretomotor fibers. So, hence special visceral efferent is also involved. Now, what does it basically do? The facial movements, taste, it carries salivation, lacrimation, all tears, all fluid will come out with the facial nerve. 
and it is the nerve of the second pharyngeal arch is what you need to remember. Now, what are the important components of it? You have a facial nerve proper, intermediate nerve, which is a sensory division. Proper means it is a motor division. Now, the facial nerve proper, it contains special visceral efferents that uh, innervate the muscles of the facial expression. Then, intermediate nerve is a sensory division which has got general somatic efferents, special visceral afferents and general visceral efferents. Now, what is the very important ganglion that uh, comes to our mind when we talk facial nerve doctor? Geniculate ganglion. Which is the ganglion that comes to our mind whenever we talk trigeminal? Gesserian. Right? Okay. Now, let's talk about it. Cerebellopontine angle tumors in acoustic neuroma we discussed. Seventh nerve, eighth nerve, fifth nerve, they are all in very close relation with cerebellopontine angle. It enters into the internal artery meatus and it passes through the facial canal and it will be finally leaving the skull through the stylomastoid foramen and it comes out and forms the temporal, mandibular, zygomatic, buccal, cervical, answer cerve, answer cervicalis, right, I am sorry, pesanserinus, I think I am going into slowly a state of uh, algemate, uh, very early, right. General somatic afferent, we need to remember, geniculate ganglion. From where is it bringing the sensory fibers, doctor? Posterior surface of the external ear. External ear has got uh, extensive innervation coming from fifth nerve, seventh nerve, tenth nerve. All these are involved in uh, innervation of it. Posterior surface of the external ear via the posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve typically will be bringing the sensory supply which is basically general somatic apparent component of it. Ultimately, who receives all the sensations touching the back of our ear in the brainstem, which nucleus? It projects centrally to the spinal trigeminal tract and the nucleus is uh, the place where it will be ultimately reaching. Then, special visceral afferents. Once more, geniculate ganglion is important and where will they ultimately project in the pons? There is a sensory nucleus common for three nerves. Ninth nerve, tenth nerve, seventh nerve. Nucleus, tractus, solitarius. NTS, ninth, tenth and uh, seventh. Why common sensory nucleus for all? Because taste reaches there and they thought uh, why only trigeminal should, I mean seventh should enjoy the taste. Let us also feel the taste of laddu, jilebi, everything. Let us share a common uh, taste nucleus in the pons. So solitary tract nucleus, it will be reaching. From there it will be bringing the sensation from the anterior two thirds of the tongue taste buds. Otherwise we should start from here and go up. So, anterior two thirds of the tongue taste will reach the geniculate ganglion. From there, it will be reaching the nucleus tractus solitarius, which is the sensory nucleus of the seventh nerve. Then it has got an intermediate component, intermediate nerve, which is also part of the SVA component. Then it has got a carded tympani. So, what is carded tympani? Corda tympani is typically located in the tympanic cavity. Corda tympani will be forming now. When the facial nerve is about to go down and come out of the stylomastoid foramen, that vertical segment. You remember there are three segments while it is passing through internal and acoustic meatus. What are they? Through the ear. One oblique, one horizontal, one vertically down. From that, the corda tympani will basically arise. We discussed it in a big detail in ENT, no point, I don't have energy for repetition. You can review those previous videos. 
So, cardiac tympani contains both special visceral afferent and general visceral afferent fibers. Then you are also having uh, um, uh, uh, yes, general visceral afferent component. From there will GVA come from pharyngeal wall, soft palate. From there the sensory innervation reaches the geniculate ganglion and that is carried by the facial nerve. So that is the GVA component, but it really doesn't have much of uh, clinical significance. Then facial nerve is very important especially for providing ultimately the secretomotor fibers which will make the lacrimal gland to shed tears when we are sad or when we are happy. And sublingual and uh, submandibular glands also, secretomotor fibers are basically from the seventh cranial nerve. That is a general visceral efferent because it is secretomotor, that's the reason. Now, doctor, obviously, when we have to pass tears or whenever we have to salivate using our sublingual submandibular, from where the instruction begins? in the pons, which is the nucleus, it is the superior salivatory nucleus in the caudal pons, which is very important for the GVE component to ultimately flow out. Now what is the lacrimal pathway doctor, how are the tears ultimately produced when we discover that we got the first rank, when we were thinking we will be disqualified in the exam. So why the tears and how the tears come? Lacrimal pathway begins at superior salivatory nucleus in the caudal pons. It projects via the intermediate nerve and reaches the geniculate ganglion. But it does not form any ganglionic connections there. There is something like pre and post. Without stopping there, it will be passing via the intermediate nerve, passes to the greater petrosal nerve, then passes to the nerve of the pterygoid canal and reaches the pterygopalatine ganglion. A pterygopalatine ganglion, it is the France airport. There you will change the planes and then catch another flight uh, to go to New York. Of course, there are direct flights also, right? So, it continues as a postganglionic neuron of the pterygopalatine ganglion. It passes to the inferior orbital fissure because superior orbital fissure is all very busy. It is carrying oculomotor, trochlear, all the motor fibers. No place and no time for tears. So, tear should come means inferior orbital fissure, so something should go and that is how the fibers will be passing to the gigomatic nerve which is a branch of the which division? Second division of the trigeminal and the lacrimal nerve which is the branch of the first division, ophthalmic division of the tail nerve phi and ultimately they go and innervate the lacrimal gland. So summarize doctor, super salivatory nucleus, intermediate nerve, greater petrosal nerve, reaching pterygopalatine ganglion and from there the postganglionic fibers passing to the inferior orbital fissure via the zygomatic nerve and the lacrimal nerve and ultimately innervate the secretory motor fibers to the lacrimal gland without a break of the gasp. You must be able to remember in the tomorrow's exam. Now, it is also innervating secretory motor fibers which are going to the submandibular gland, no? How does it pass? That also instruction starts from super salivatory nucleus. Uh, it projects to the intermediate nerve and with the caudal tympani to reach the submandibular ganglion. Now, one point that you need to appreciate is caudal tympani is only a carrier of the fibers. Caudal tympani is not really uh, what you call causing any salivation. It won't really go innervate and do anything. Somebody need to carry the superior salivatory nucleus instruction to the salivary glands and make it to secrete. So in the process, it is like uh, 
relay marathon until some place somebody will carry after that it will throw into other kind it is our artificial division zygomatic is fifth nerve this is seventh nerve and that is pons but uh, it is ultimately carried by all this and ultimate place it has to reach right so what will you remember about submandibular superior salivary nucleus to the intermediate nerve and carotid tympani it will make it to ultimately reach the submandibular ganglion and from there the postganglionic fibers will project and innervate the submandibular and sublingual glands is what i want to underscore now we have a special visceral efferent component what is it important for ultimately for innervating all these muscles so one of the favorite question of the examiner is what are all the muscles which are innervated by facial nerve no challenge all facial muscles except levator palpebrae brain are all innervated by the facial nerve additionally what will you remember stapedius is the one innervated by the facial nerve posterior belly of the digastric because anterior belly is innervated by the mandibular division of the fifth cranial nerve right then sphenohyoid is another important muscle which you need to remember which is innervated by the facial nerve is what i want to underscore now doctor the next important issue is how will be the facial nerve lesion will be leading to in this there is one small gimmick lmn umn how do you differentiate no big deal so there is a loss of the corneal reflex because efferent for eye closure whenever your eye got irritated is coming from facial if it is paralyzed then eyelid doesn't close and continuously eyelid is open means there is a corneal erosions corneal ulceration then since cardiac tympani is important for carrying the taste sensation from the anterior two thirds of the tongue a jusia in the anterior two thirds of the tongue is another important feature since stapedius is involved hyperacusis is another important problem due to stapedius paralysis so what is meant by bell's palsy bell's palsy is the element type of paralysis generally when through the facial canal in the ear when the facial nerve is passing there any edema can lead to compression which is an element type now the entire half of the face on the side where the facial nerve got injured both upper fibers lower fibers everything got paralyzed pura half of the face then what is meant by bell's phenomena typically somebody who had a lmn palsy whenever they try to close the eyes the affected eye looks up and out which is called as the bell's phenomena all this is due to the aberrant innervation which occur post paralysis right so bell's phenomena affected eye looks up and out is a important feature of the lmn type now how do you differentiate lmn from that of a supranuclear umn type doctor very simple first you need to understand how is the facial nerve nucleus is innervated from from param pita paramatma motor cortex in the brain right just like our anterior consuls which will make our muscles contract are controlled by parampita paramatma motor cortex through cortico spinal tract there is also a cortico bulbar pathway which connects the motor cortex with the cranial nuclei in the brain stem now how are those umn fibers are basically innervating the uh, seventh nerve nucleus let us look into it typically if you see each seventh nerve nucleus is bilaterally innervated both the sides so that is the reason suppose if uh, there is a lesion supranuclear lesion then what will happen the facial nerve nucleus on the uh, facial nerve nucleus 
of the uh, it will be sending the fibers to the ipsilateral and also to the contralateral one right so the contralateral nucleus will be falling short of uh, the innervation that it is expected to receive from the uh, opposite side agree now if you look at the uh, Thinner nucleus. From the nucleus, the facial nerve will come out. Ultimately, that facial nerve will innervate the upper and lower part. Right? So, between these two parts, do you think both the parts are controlled by the corticobulbar fibers or only lower part is only controlled by the corticobulbar fibers? Both are controlled by the huh? both of them are controlled by the corticobulbar fibers. Then, if there is a corticobulbar fiber lesion, then uh, uh, there should not be uh, what you call yeah, but but ipsilateral will control the. Why there is a sparing of the upper part? Because of uh, upper part of the face receives from both the sides, whereas the lower part will only receive from contralateral, contralateral corticobulbar fibers. So that is the reason if the contralateral got affected. Then the lower half only get uh, paralyzed, but the upper half is, since it is bilaterally innervated, it goes unparalyzed. Right? So, that is all about the supranuclear lesion uh, which spares the upper part. But, so we say upper part, it is not entire upper half of the face. Lot of times people think upper half means entire upper half. But you see any stroke patient who has got a upper motor neuron type of facial nerve palsy. Where will you see commonly upper motor neuron type of facial palsy? Stroke patients because stroke leads to bleeding. Bleeding makes the UMN type of paralysis and UMN will lead to contralateral lower half of the face get paralyzed. But the upper half of the face is since it is bilaterally innervated, it is paid. But it is not entire half, but uh, above the orbit, supraorbital part, the folds of the face is the one which is uh, much more densely bilaterally innervated is what we have to basically appreciate. So, that is all the story of central facial nerve palsy. Then uh, another common uh, area where people confuse is Bulbar palsy and pseudo bulbar palsy. What does it mean? Bulbar and pseudo bulbar palsy. The jaw muscles, everything are all innervated by? By? Fifth cranial nerve nucleus, right? Fifth cranial nerve nucleus in the pons is in turn controlled by? Cortico bulbar fibers. And uh, it is in fact both the corticobulbar fibers bilaterally will innervate it. Right? Suppose if you take my right fifth cranial nucleus, my right side and left side, both sides uh, corticobulbar fibers will come and innervate my right fifth cranial nucleus. So, if I get a stroke or any injury, only on one side corticobulbar fibers, immediately I do not get a UMN type of uh, fifth cranial nerve uh, lesion. How will you elicit uh, which jerk is, uh, which deep tendon reflex is controlled by the fifth cranial nerve? Jaw jerk. So, if you check the jaw jerk, UMN type of lesion may what should happen? Jaw jerk should become exaggerated. LMN lesion may jaw jerk should become reflexic. 
just like your biceps reflex and triceps reflex. But in the case of uh, a corticobulbar lesion, what will happen? If my right side corticobulbar fibers connecting my motor cortex with my physical nerve nucleus are uh, interrupted, since it is bilaterally innervated, I immediately do not get UMN type of features. Only when bilateral corticobulbar fibers are affected, then only I get a UMN type and then an exaggerated jaw jet. So, pseudobulbar palsy is nothing but a UMN type of a bulbar palsy which occur if there is a bilateral corticobulbar fiber interruption. But can I get a stroke on both sides of the brain? Unless I am very fortunate enough. So, demyelinating lesions or amyotropic lateral stenosis, motor neuron disease is there, no? Then also there can be degeneration which can occur and affect the bilateral corticobulbar fibers. Then I get a UMN type of uh, uh, what you call uh, bulbar palsy. Then I will have even with a small stroke, uncontrolled laughter, uncontrolled tears, exaggerated jaw jerk. So these are all the features of that uh, UMN type of a bulbar palsy which is called pseudobulbar palsy is what need to be remembered.